let's go back to, we've established a new floor. Really, there is nobody that should be consuming less than 1.2 grams of protein per, uh, per kilogram per day. What happens as we start to increase that from 1.2 to 1.6? Great question. And this is, again, is where I turn to the experts like Stu Phillips. In fact, he did a really great meta-analysis looking at about 49 different studies in adults that were undergoing, this, these are controlled trials, resistance training alone or resistance training plus supplemental protein. And the supplemental protein went up to 1.6, well, actually it went up above that. But um, what was really found in that study was that even going from like 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight per day, obviously, to 1.6 grams per kilogram body weight, people gained about 27% more lean body mass and 10% more sh muscle strength mm. compared to just training alone. Same training, just adding the protein, right? Um, that's pretty big. I, I was going to say that is bigger than I would expact, it, yeah. especially on the strength side. It, it, exa in the strength side, they were, yep. they were gaining. So the protein itself, but if you think about it in a way, we're talking about supply and demand, right? Yep. So now we're talking about more optimal, a little more optimal. We're talking about people that are training. That's number one. You need to be training. If we're talking about optimal protein intake, you need to be training. Um, and then, you know, what's happening when you're training is you're breaking down muscle. You need protein to support the repair of that muscle and the rebuilding of it. And so that makes sense in a way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was surprised by the strength as well. And so really once you get once you went above 1.6 grams, you would there was still increases in muscle yeah, protein synthesis. Yeah, but the curve synthesis. is slowing down. It's it was it's I like the the analogy that Stu Phillips uses. He says, like, if you have like a wet washcloth and you squeeze all you squeeze it to get all the water out, you know, like most of that water is coming out at one point six grams per kilogram body weight. But you can keep squeezing a little and you're getting you're still getting some water out. It's just it's just sort of marginal. It's like most people don't care about that difference. Some people do. Now, let's say you're someone that's obsessed with banking muscle mass. You're going to care about that. Let's say you're, a, you know, a high level athlete definitely going to have to go above 1.6, right? That's when you get into the more 2, 2.2 grams per kilogram body weight. So people that are doing a high level of training, whether that's endurance or strength training, resistance training, right? Because endurance athletes, I mean, they're, they're you, you are battling cat um, being catabolic. Right. So, um, so that would be, I think, I think the evidence for more optimal, you're talking about 1.6 grams per kilogram body weight. And then you can, you can get marginal benefits above that, right? Up to like two, two point two grams per kilogram body weight. But again, that's again people that are really training. Yeah, to me, there's an analogy here with ApoB and cardiovascular disease, right? So, um, if you look at the uh, the three bodies of evidence, so if you look at all of the epidemiologic data, if you look at all of the clinical trial data, and if you look at all of the Mendelian randomization data, and you plot every single one of them on a graph, and there's a beautiful graph which we'll include in the show notes that does this. So on the x-axis, you and it's done in LDLC, but again, LDLC, ApoB, easy, easy to sort of uh, view them together. So you have on the x-axis, you have LDLC going down, right? So from 160, 140, 120, you know, 100, 80, 60. So descending LDLC, and on the y-axis you have mortality, cardiovascular mortality. So not surprisingly, all of these point down. As LDLC goes lower, uh, mort cardiovascular mortality goes lower. Um, what's interesting, though, is you can see that there are different points in the curve at which it starts to matter more. And at some point, it flattens out. You don't get as much benefit from reduction. And so we could use the same argument of, well, what is optimal? What is so, so, because we're doing the reverse here. Here, lower is better as opposed to going up on protein. But um, Peter Libby has done an analysis that has demonstrated that you will continue to see a meaningful reduction in cardiovascular disease as ApoB heads towards 30 milligrams per deciliter. 30 milligrams per deciliter is really low by most people's standards. For context, 60 milligrams per deciliter is about the fifth percentile at the population level. 30 milligrams per deciliter is about what a child is. So, you know, we're born with relatively low levels of ApoB, and as we age, they just keep going up and up and up. Um, 
which of course is one of the things that's driving cardiovascular disease is this rise in ApoB. So the question then becomes, how low do you need to go? Should everybody be walking around at 30 milligrams per deciliter? Is that the solution to eliminating ASCVD? And the answer is probably not, right? It probably depends on your previous exposure though, right? So if I have a patient who's already had two stents placed and has a significant burden of disease, you bet your bottom line they're at 30 milligrams per deciliter of ApoB, even if we have to put three drugs on them to make sure that's the case, because their burden of disease and their lifetime exposure to ApoB has been so high. But if I have an individual who's 40 years old, who has perfectly pristine coronary arteries and is walking around with an ApoB of 60 milligrams per deciliter, I don't think you need to do a thing. I think they're just fine. And again, it's, it's, it's the inability, I think, for people to understand that level of nuance and understanding when it's worth the second squeeze versus when just the sloppy squeeze is good enough is, 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 is very frustrating for a person like me who craves nuance. Right. Agreed. I love that analogy. And I think it's perfect because, again, I, I do think most people that are training probably are getting a great amount of benefit from 1.6 grams per kilogram body weight. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't go above that and still get a little more benefit. Right. And as certainly when you start to get into that, you know, energy deficit phase as well. Like, so we were talking about elite you know, endurance athletes, that's one way to be in an ener energy deficit. But there's also people that are actively trying to lose fat, gain muscle. If you want to lose fat and gain muscle at the same time, you're going to have to take in a lot of protein. Yeah. And, and so that's another very important point. Another point I want to make is you're still dealing with an asymmetric target. And so we tell our patients to be closer to two. Now, I know that's just going to get a whole bunch of people on the anti-protein train just losing their mind. I can just see the phosphorylation going off right now <laughs> as they're watching this clip. How is this guy so irresponsible to tell his patients to eat two grams of protein per kilogram of body weight? Didn't he just hear what Rhonda said? 1.6 is good enough for most people. Well, my patients, unfortunately, don't live in labs. Unfortunately, Rhonda, my patients live in this place. It's called the real world. And in the real world, you can't always hit your targets. Some days you do, some days you don't. Some days you're traveling, some days you're not. Some days you can figure it out, some days you can't. So if I'm telling somebody to hit 1.6 and one day they're at 1.2, another day they're at 1.7, another day they're at 1.5, another day they're at 1.9, on average, they might hit 1.6. But how many days were they below versus how many days were they above? Let's just say it's an equal split. But we've just established the shape of this curve is like this. So that means every day you're below, the downside is much greater than the upside of being above. In other words, all the days you're above are not making up for all the days you're below. So what I'd really like to do is shift the range so that your low day is 1.6 and your high day is maybe 2.2. And then guess what? You don't have days where you are ever, ever amino acid restricted. Right. And this is the difference between people who take care of people in the real world and bozos who write on Substack who don't know the first thing about clinical medicine when it comes to managing athletes and people who have to fend for themselves every day with every meal. And this is why I'm so tired of talking about this, but I feel we need to talk about it. And so if you're sitting there listening to this and you're confused and you're asking, oh my God, should I be eating two grams per day? Yeah, more or less. And that way, if you fall short at 1.6, you can be confident that you're okay. But if you're aiming at 1.6, and you have a bad day, and you will, when you hit 1.2, you might be taking a step backwards, and you won't make up for it the next day. I can just tell you um, from personal experience, it, it, it's actually smarter to aim higher because I'm constantly not re meeting the 1.6. I am not. This is the thing. <laughs> People look at me like I'm a protein eating machine, which first of all, I'm not. But secondly, I have a hard time hitting my goals too. I'm busy. I miss meals. Sometimes we just have a low protein meal. Like for whatever reason, my kids want to have pasta for dinner and they don't, and we literally have pasta and sauce. It's like, there's no freaking protein in this anyway. So it's very difficult if you don't have a chef preparing your every meal. And I never have a chef preparing any of my meals unless I'm out at a restaurant to hit these targets every day. Right. Um, and 
Also, I just it, I, I was thinking about this because we mentioned the 1.2 being the sort of the minimum buy-in. The 1.6 grams per kilogram body isn't necessarily just for people training a little bit. It's also older adults that are not training, like because we talked about the anabolic resistance, them needing twice as much protein as well. And so what you're talking about here is going up to two so that you can really have an average at least of 1.6, right? You're, you're getting that average. But again- well, And it's it, just, I never want to fall below that. Below it. That's really the point is I know, because again, I'm training every single day, right? Yeah. Now, am I training like a madman? No. But seven days a week, I'm either doing some form of cardio or something in the gym. So it's just, I know that I'm going to take steps backwards if I'm below 1.6. So I'm going to overshoot so that my down day is 1.6. Right. And if my up day is 2.5 once in a while, who cares? Because that gets to the next point. Show me the data. Show me the data that eating 2.5 grams of protein per kilogram per day is even remotely harmful. I'm still waiting for it. I'm still waiting for the data. David Allison wrote a piece on LinkedIn recently where it was basically a call to anyone. Just show me the data that meet these criteria. Human clinical trial of this duration, da 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 da, da. Like nothing but crickets. Yeah. I mean, I haven't seen any human data either, for sure. I mean, the, the most negative data I saw recently was a study that looked at total parenteral nutrition in ICU patients where the question was, hey, should we be ramming high amounts of protein in these people? And the most negative thing you could say is it had no benefit. And that's interesting. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So maybe we shouldn't be ramming high protein, total parenteral nutrition into the central veins of critically ill ICU patients. Um, but it didn't harm them. Right. <laughs> and if anybody's going to be harmed, I would think it's the people that are in renal failure. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, I haven't seen that data yeah. either. 